image here is an artistic representation of the Seven Sisters song line by Josephine Munich. Um, and this is an image from the NMA. So the Seven Sisters song line is one of the most expansive dreaming tracks um, that you can see here in the middle, really, you know, tracks across Australia. And this story, uh, the song line that goes along with this story, um, it's, it's very complex. It's a story of magic, uh, desire, chases, escapes. Um, but really, it's about the enduring strength and resilience of kinship ties. So it tells the story of a group of sisters leaving from Western Australia, being pursued by an evil shapeshifter. The sisters are chased across the, uh, the earth and end up in the sky. What's really magical, though, about this song line is that it crosses three deserts, you know, beginning in Robo, in Nerbiwe, passes through the APY lands in the Northern Territory, across South Australia, right through to the East Coast of Australia. And more than that, it's shared by so many Aboriginal groups. It's carried by the Matu, the Ananu, the Pichanjajara, the Yankunit Jajara, and the Jajara peoples. It is also one of the oldest song lines in Australia. The NMA also has a really uh, wonderfully interactive resource on the Seven Sisters song line. So if you're interested in that, um, just have a Google of song lines uh, in MMA um, on their government website. Uh, it is you know, a great resource if you're interested in knowing a little bit more. Let's talk about star navigation and moon shadow travel because it, is, it really sounds quite mythical and quite magical. But actually, this is how the Waterman peoples of the southwest Kimberley region in the Northern Territory navigate with moon shadows and using the ecliptic path. The ecliptic path uh, is the plane of Earth's orbit around the sun. The watermen use moon shadows and stars to navigate largely because a lot of their traveling was done at night. Night was a lot cooler than during the day. I don't know how many of you listening to this lecture have spent much time in the Northern Territory, uh, but depending on what point in the year you are in, it can be very hot and very humid. And so it's a bit cooler to travel at night. And Waterman Mob also believe that distances are shorter at night. Um, there's a beautiful quote by DS uh, in Norris, and it talks about, the old people, the old man walking during the day, saying the distance get far away from you. Walk in the night, in the darkness, the distance shrinking up. Somehow it's shrinking up. The earth's pulling away from you pretty fast. Shrinking up's what they told us. But during the daytime, the earth is standing still. So we use song lines for long haul navigations. Um, if no song line existed, or if there was much you know, shorter travel, we would just use the moon and star patterns and directions alone. There's a quote that I've put on your PowerPoint slide here saying, not just song line trail, walking trail, trade routes. You sing a song, then you follow your song. It's the track you go along, singing the song like a blazed mark. Um, it's a very, very beautiful description of a song line, um, which is, you know, as we keep going back to that oral map. Okay, let's have a look at meteors and comets. Uh, so this image uh, that you've got here on your screen is Tenerala. Um, it's a site of a uh, meteor impact uh, in the central desert. We're going to look at a very beautiful story uh, about this. So the Western Aransi mob of Central Desert have a dreaming story about this site that really connects the country and the sky together. Uh, in this story, it speaks about a group of women dancing corroboree. And for those of you who don't know, corroboree for us is a type of ceremony. They were dancing <coughs> in the Milky Way and they became stars. Excuse me for one second. <coughs> To continue dancing, one of these women, the morning star, placed her baby in a coolerman, and the coolerman is a type of basket, and put him at the edge of the Milky Way. But the baby slipped and tumbled to the earth in the coolerman, and when he fell to the earth and hit the ground, it created a crater which drove the cliffs of the earth up surrounding the impact site. 
In the story, the Kuluman flipped over and hid the baby from its star parents. And each day, the morning and evening stars, the baby's parents, search for their missing baby. So this site here on your map is Narala. It's a roughly circular shaped uh, cliffs. They're about 150 meters high. They stretch for about five kilometers. What's very interesting about this story, though, is that this site is dated to 142 million years old. And yet there is a story associated with its creation. I think it's very, very cool. Um, you can actually see this story um, yourselves in the sky. Um, during our winter, if you look up at the night sky, you'll see an image of the falling Kuluman. It's just below the Milky Way in an arc of stars. In the west, this arc of stars is the western constellation of Corona Australis. We have another uh, very interesting story. Um, this is the Canamal crater, crater or the Wolf Creek crater in the Kimberley region of Western Australia. It's probably one of the best preserved craters in the world. Um, the Jaru have a story um, about the star, a star that fell from the sky and created this crater. Uh, Jaru elder Uncle Jack Jaru tells the story of this crater, stating that one day during a crescent moon, the evening star passed by very close. It became so hot that it fell to the ground. And this falling star scared the people. They stayed away from the crash site for a very long time. But it does have significance in their stories and in their artwork, and you'll see it quite commonly referred to. Now, there's a reason that they would have stayed away from the impact site. Um, Largely in across Australia, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander stories, comets and meteors are associated with evil. Um, they're seen as omens of death, punishments for breaking traditional cultural laws. I think if you consider, you know, experiencing a meteor yourself, you could see why they would be associated with such evil and such destruction. Literally a fireball from the heavens just creating sheer destruction and terror as it lands. Um, you can see this even quite recently, these stories being associated, comments and meteors being associated with um, you know, perilous activities. Um, about 200 years ago, um, over South Australia, um, there was a comet seen in the sky by South Australia mob. And this comet coincided with the introduction of smallpox in that region. So smallpox was brought to Australia uh, by the invaders and the colonists um, and it spread across Australia. In fact, it wiped out about 50 or 60% of us in its first infection. And so we have a story, quite modern, 200 years, um, being told that aligns that comet sighting with this death and destruction brought by colonists. Um, Mob also used these um, meteors and comments, you know, harness their power essentially in, you know, payback killings or, um, you know, poisonings as a result of being, uh, you know, doing things against cultural law. Um, for example, the Arab peoples, uh, there's rituals using death magic. If you chant a death spell um, over a stick and throw that stick in the direction of the person that you want to kill, if you see a meteor after this, um, then your ritual was successful um, and that meteor was the spirit of that deceased person. Um, similar uh, death spells existed for unfaithful men and women. Um, the Arab mob believed that the meteors are filled with a poison, um, Aranquilta, which is the same poison um, that you can find in some mushrooms and, and poisonous toadstools. So if you throw your spear dipped in this poison in the direction of a man who might have stolen your wife, um, then the dead man's spirit would appear as a meteor. And this was again used for unfaithful women as well. Uh, it's a bit, the story is a little bit different. Um, it speaks of the woman having the fat sucked out of her, perishing as an emancipated skeleton with her spirit becoming the meteor in the sky. So when we, when we look at these stories, we see narrative being used as a way to direct social behaviour. Um, to document law and custom and, you know, educate the community and, you know, not just our kids, but the community on appropriate behaviours. And this is introducing, and again, that sort of interconnection of the sky, the earth and the community and linking them all together in this narrative war form.
Um, but many mob uh, across Australia will associate um, meteors and comets with death and death omens. Uh, for example, the Lidja peoples believe that spirits can cast stones down from the clouds as punishment for bad men or for the breaking of cultural law. Um, the Gali mob, um, there are stories which speak to men who have died after being killed from glowing stones which dropped from the clouds. Now this is very interesting because it's not only you know, a warning but an actual story including the death of mob as a result of these comets of glowing stones. Um, the Nali mob actually have a story um, about broken traditional law um, and this is quite a recent story again um, where they shared sacred cultural knowledge with an ethnographer from the Western ethnographer and as punishment glowing rocks rained on the community the following evening. So these types of stories really speak to the sanctity um, of Indigenous law and you know, some of the severity of punishments for breaking tribal law, but then also, of course, to the impacts of meteors. And what is really interesting about this is that there are a lot more stories in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander oral traditions about comets and meteor impacts um, and about craters as a result of the these medial impacts, then there is verified um, crater sites in Australia by the West. So we have about 30 confirmed craters in Australia. Uh, some of these have been formed by comets, some asteroids, and some by meteors. Um, some of these are a few thousand years old, and we've got a couple that are over a billion years old. Um, but while the West only recognises 30, there's heaps more than that um, in Indigenous oral stories. So maybe um, there's a p possibility that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have these knowledges of these craters, of these experiences, and the West doesn't have that yet. So there's the ability for learning um, and education to come um, at that cultural interface between you know, Western astronomy and Indigenous astronomy. Okay, let's talk about variable stars. Um, variable stars are my absolute favourite um, indigenous astronomical science stories and, and um, well, science in general, um, largely because of how much longer Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have had the knowledges of variable stars, so much sooner than the West. So in about 350 BC, I think, um, Aristotle wrote that stars are unchanging and invariable. And this belief that stars were unchanging and invariable was maintained in Western science for like two millennia. We don't really see many changes until about 1596 um, when a scientist is studying the star mirror. And date, this is David Fabricus. Um, and this belief was disrupted. Um, he found that star brightness could change, um, but there was no understanding uh, of the math as it related to that. By, I think, 1662, we start seeing um, the amplitude and periodicity of star brightness. Um, we start seeing the math for that formed in the West. And then by the 1830s, of course, we have the famed astronomer John Herschel, who studied a wide variety um, of variable stars, and this from Western science is when we start to see variable star brightness being a study um, in Western astronomy and Western astrophysics. Um, now, Herschel studied and found variabil variability sorry, uh, in the Betelgeuse star, which is in the Orion Nebula. Now, what's really interesting is that we here in Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, We've known about star variability, including that of Betelgeuse, for thousands of years. So if you don't have a strong science uh, background, variable stars are essentially what they sound like. They're stars that are variable and, and meaning that they change brightness. Um, Western science has really only known about these for like maybe 200 or 400 years. But in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander stories, they go back thousands of years, these descriptions of variable stars. Now, this is very important for well, a number of reasons. But firstly, because these are such subtle changes in brightness. They occur over many years and it takes considerable consideration and considerable time, observational time, um, to deduce that a variable star even exists. 
And yet we have them told over and over again in our oral stories, generation to generation in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. So we observed not only the very subtle and slow changes in you know, three of the giant red stars, Betelgeuse, Aldebaran and Antares, but also the different speeds of light variation. And we included these in our oral stories. Now, this is really important, right? We're not even just acknowledging, we're not even just saying, oh, those brightnesses have changed. We're also documenting the different rate, the different speed of light changes that exists between these or among these giant red variable stars. So the Koga the Mula have a really beautiful story that depicts this star variability. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Um, I will note that this image is uh, borrowed from Lehman and Hamacher um, in one of their papers on this. <coughs> so the Kokotha Mula, <coughs> excuse me, are an Aboriginal um, community uh, mob in South Australia. And in their story um, on this, there is a hunter named Naruna and the hunter's presence is the same orientation of stars uh, that the West would view as the Greek Orion. Now the hunter is in love with the sisters, right, who form the Pleiades uh, in the West. So what we have Eugalia here in Kolkata Mula um, language. But these sisters don't love him back and they try and escape his advances. And these sisters are protected by their elder sister who forms the Hades star cluster. So it's in the middle here we see Cambogia. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, I've got a tickle in my throat. Um, so the story states that the elder sister com tries to combat uh, the, the hunter. So to combat the elder sister, the hunter generates a magical fire in his right hand which is the Betelgeuse giant red star. So if you see in the larger circle on this image towards the bottom of that larger circle on the right hand side. But the elder sister uses her own fire magic, which she has in her left foot, which is the Aldebaran red star, which you'll see this, the middle circle um, on this image. <clears throat> and she kicks dust into the face of the hunter and this humiliates him and his magical fire dissipates. The elder sister then places a row of dingo pups between the sisters and the hunter to shield them. And you can see them on this image as well. It's that curve of stars that form um, Orion's shield in the Western Greek traditions. The hunter recovers and he again tries to use his fire magic against the elder sister. And she tries to create her own to ward him off, but she can't create it in time. So she sings out to the dingo father, Baba, for assistance. Then Baba and the hunter fight, and while the hunter loses, the sisters laugh. And this humiliate, humiliation causes the hunter to once again lose his fire magic. Now this story might just seem like a beautiful telling of conquest, of unrequited love. Um, but it's clearly very much about star brightness and the rate of variation. Now this is incredibly interesting when you get down to the science of it. Um, now this speaks directly to the variability of the stars Betelgeuse and Albadaran, but also it describes the relative change periods of these stars. And while, why this is so interesting um, and so, I guess, amazing um, to have this knowledge is that if we look at Betelgeuse, for example, it only varies in brightness every 400 days. And when it does vary, it's by one magnitude. And Albadaran varies brightness at irregular periods, but even only by 0 0.2 magnitudes. So we have such significant and such consistent stargazing by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to know that Aldebaran could not regenerate as quickly as Betelgeuse. And so such we see in the story, the elder sister could not generate her fire magic quick enough to defeat the hunter the second time. So in this narrative, we're looking at both Betelgeuse and Aldebaran that's being described as brightening as they fill with fire, right? So we see the hunter's right hand fades when he's humiliated and her fire magic dissipates 
after she kicks dust in his face. So the hunter's fire magic returns quick. It doesn't allow the sister to prepare her own magic. So then she has to call on the dingo father to intervene, after which the hunter's magic again dissipates. So what we're really looking at here is this complex science about periodicity of Betelgeuse and Albedarum. And Mob knew that the brightness of Betelgeuse, the hunter, fluctuates quicker than that of the elder sister, Aldebaran, which we see when she calls for the dingo father to help because she's not able to generate fire at the same intervals. Now this story um, of Orion as the hunter chasing these sisters is remarkably similar to non-connected cultures outside of Australia and a lot of other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities here in Australia have these stories. Um, but what this means is that many communities, many Indigenous peoples across the world have a similar story as it relates to this. Um, the frequency of these brightness peaks uh, obviously could have been detected by Aboriginal people many times over a person's life, right? We're looking at 400 days here for Betelgeuse and at irregular periods for Aldebaran. But within Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, stories, there are inclusions of much rarer events, much rarer astronomical events. Um, these include comets, um, you know, bright comets, which are seen, you know, only every 10 years. Um, total solar eclipses, they only occur, you know, every few hundred years and only from a given location. Uh, crater forming meteorite impacts, you know, we only see these occurring every few thousand years. So this really speaks to the longevity uh, of Indigenous storytelling. So the image on your screen now depicts uh, the seven sisters or the Pleiades. It is a star cluster and this is referred to as the seven sisters in many communities. Um, you can see this during our summers, uh, very low in the sky. Now this star cluster <clears throat> is extremely relevant to global astronomy and global cultures um, because so many of us globally have stories about these um, stars and so many of them depict these stars as sisters, young women, um, even the Greeks, which is where we get that term Pleiades. And they're very special, these stars uh, around the world. Um, some cultural astronomers even think that the similarity of stories that we see globally to do with these star cluster, this star cluster, could speak to the fact that this story actually evolved with us, was brought with us before we even spread across the world, right? So from our original story, from very early humans, before we spread across the world. And they think this because there are just too many similarities um, in these stories as they relate to sisters across unconnected cultures across the globe. I think that is quite cool to think about that we might have knowledges passed down in Indigenous storytelling globally that come from before we even spread out across. Within Australia, the dreaming stories of the Seven Sisters is among the most common story told. Uh, for example, the Camilleroy in New South Wales and Southern Queensland depict uh, the Pleiades as several girls termed Nyenye. And these young girls live on Earth and were incredibly beautiful. Orion, who was the hunter in the previous story, was termed Berebre. Uh, meaning several boys who had not gone through initiation. So initiation is a type of ceremony and we have um, gendered initiation. So this is the initiation of young men. They hadn't gone through their ceremony. And the Bori Ray have fire and this fire is represented by the star Regal. So if you look back at this previous image that we used to talk about Perk the Moolah, you'll see uh, Rigel, Regal, depending on the way you pronounce it, up here in the larger circle at the top of the larger circle. Um, and so that is a fire poker. We have a fire poker in this story represented by the sword of Orion. 
Now the least beautiful of these sisters hides from the boys. Um, and this talks about why you might only see six of the girls um, in the sky sometimes. So if you only see six, it's because the, the, the least attractive girl is hiding from the boys. Now the Briobre would chase the sisters and so they asked the sky creator to lift them into the sky so they could escape. As punishment for chasing the girls, the boys were placed into the belt of Orion. But they still attempted to pursue the girls. So a male elder, represented in this story as Albadaran, was placed between the girls and the boys. The stars which sit near Albadaran in an arrow shape represent his ganya, which is a hut. And the upside down V of the stars next to him, which is the horns of Taurus the Bill in the west, are his hut. The star Regal is the fire of Biraye and the sword Orion is their fire poker. Now there are many variations on this story, but they are all based in lore and teach mob about the importance of respecting women. Okay, let's talk about Ancestors Camp. Um, this is again probably one of my favourite, second favourite um, stories as they relate to astronomical science in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. So for us, we call it the Ancestors Camp. In the West, you may know this as the Mal Magellanic Clouds. They are a satellite galaxy that orbit the Milky Way. And of course, if you don't know, the Milky Way is our 200 plus billion star galaxy. Now, most people would look at this, you know, from the common eye and it would just appear as straying parts of the Milky Way. But the Ancestors Camps are also entire galaxies they're just a lot smaller than our Milky Way. Across Australia, many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mobs have stories about these clouds. They are very often linked to Indigenous law, and they often represent an old uncle or auntie who are too old to get their own food, so are fed by the Milky Way. And this speaks you know, to that cultural custom and to that kinship responsibility to care for your elders. Uh, up north, the Lidger mob believe that Walnari live in the Magellanic Clouds, this is spirits, and they are celestial deities to innate punishments for bad mob on Earth. Let's have a look at the emu in the sky. Now I'm sure if any of you have heard of any indigenous astronomy story, you have heard of the emu in the sky. It is perhaps the most well-known uh, indigenous astronomy story. Now this again is very important because it speaks to the different ways that Indigenous people and the West tend to look at things. Um, so for us in Australia, um, sorry for the West, they tend to only look at things that are visible, right? Not what is not visible. But what's interesting about the way we look at the Inu in the sky is that this looking of things that are not there, right? So the dark paths. Um, is shared by Indigenous peoples, you know, globally. We see it here, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in Australia, Māori peoples in Aotearoa, Polynesian peoples, uh, the Maya and Inca peoples. We see some in South America, some in Indonesia, uh, some in South Africa. Some communities in these regions also consider what is not seen. They consider these dark paths. And this, of course, for us here in Australia, is so interconnected to that aspect of our culture where we view everything in life as being interconnected. And this is no different in the sky. This is no different in astronomy. So the Inu in the sky is a dark cloud which can be seen slightly below the Southern Cross. And it is, this Inu is made by tracing the dust lanes, so these dark spaces. For mobs from New South Wales and southern Queensland, the Sky Emu has a significant role in determining everything from ceremony times to resource abundance and retrieval. Throughout the year, with different seasons, uh, we see the tilt of the earth is quite different, and so the position of the Emu in the Milky Way changes. These differences dictate when it is appropriate times to conduct ceremony, when you should collect resources, um, and so you'll see just between these two images, see the changing? First we have both legs down and now we have a PS3 running. So for example, when the emu is seen in April and May, this is when the Milky Way rises in the evening, we see changes in the visibility and placement of the emu, like this one we see on our screen where it appears to be running. <laughs> 
This representation in the sky means that on Earth, emus are in breeding mode. The female is chasing the man. This changes also show us that emu will soon lay their eggs and will be able to collect them for food. So this is linking sky changes to earth changes and to the availability of food and resources um, in a really beautifully and connected way through consistent observation of the sky. By June and July, we see the sky has changed again. And now it appears to show the male emu brooding his chicks, right, sitting on top of the eggs. This shows Mob that there is still time to collect emu eggs for consumption. And remembering, you know, we have that strong belief in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in Australia that the sky mirrors the earth. So we are constantly looking upwards for guidance and directions for things that are happening on the ground. We're looking to the sky for that guidance and direction. Okay, let's have a relation uh, look. Sorry, at the relationship between Earth, Sun, and Moon. So, mob across Australia, we've got very different stories about the sun. But in nearly all of these stories, the sun is presented as a woman and the moon is presented as a man. Uh, most of these stories even attribute colour to, to these stories to associate for why we see the sun as such this vibrant colour. Um, I have a quote here from Norris in CSIRO that says, She gets up every morning and puts on her red ochre which is why we get the red sunrise, lights a stringy bark tree and carries it across the sky, giving us all light and heat, travels to the west and puts out the stringy bark tree and travels around back to camp in the east for the morning. For the ULE of Northwest and New South Wales, the sun is depicted as a woman. The stories say the woman's sun is always chasing the moon. Now there are differing stories about whether she is chasing him to make love or she's chasing to kill him. But either way, he is not interested and he flees from her across the sky. So the Yuli and Camilleroy believe that a solar eclipse occurs when she catches up with him. Now I'm going to talk more about solar eclipses as they relate to Indigenous narrative science in a couple of slides, so keep this story in mind. So let's look at the moon. The Jamba mob and Wara Mari Wari mobs of New South Wales call the moon Jian. Now the story that they have associates with Jian is that he was a beautiful young boy who drowned and nobody attempted to save him. When he was later revived, he went on to try and kill everyone who had let him down drown. Anyone he was unable to kill later identified him as the massacre, so he fled the punishment and escaped to the sky where he lives with the moon. Now they believe that the moon man shows his blood when there is a lunar eclipse, which turns the moon red. Uh, there are mobs across Australia which have stories associated with lunar eclipses. In several stories, for example, the Wallow Fury, Wurangu and others, the sun is represented as female, the moon male, and they make love. Um, and when the moon and sun come together romantically, this causes an eclipse. Now this is quite interesting because in the stories, his body covers hers, right? And this is scientifically accurate, right? If we look at what an eclipse is, it is the moon covering the sun from view. Let's talk a little bit more about solar eclipses in further detail as they relate to indigenous sky sciences. So what we looked at in the last two slides are stories around the sun and moon, but also eclipses. Um, and the fact that many mob across Australia have these stories. Uh, why this is so important, I guess, is that solar eclipses don't happen very often. Um, and even when they do happen, they're not visible from every location when they do occur. Um, so for example, in Australia, in the next 100 years, I think we're going to have about eight eclipses viewable. Um, and that's viewable from all of Australia, right? So only eight eclipses. And when they are viewed in Australia, it's only really like 80 miles wide on the ground. So it's not large occurrences that you're going to see from every point in Australia that you're all going to see an eclipse. That's not really how it works, a complete um, solar eclipse. Um, a total eclipse only happens once every 400 years. So a partial eclipse we'll see about eight in the next 100 years, but a total eclipse only happens every 400. 
Now, why is this so important? Well, largely because it speaks to the longevity of Indigenous oral traditions. Uh, we have stories here talking about total solar eclipses, and these have been carried for 400 years of generations who may have never seen a solar eclipse, but these stories are continued, they're shared, um, and they continue to be told. Um, and we see these representations of stories that talk about eclipses, not only in our oral traditions, um, they're in physical depictions too. Um, at the Kurungai Chase National Park in northern Sydney, uh, there's several engravings there uh, that depict a crescent shape and a man and a woman. And the man is drawn in front of the woman, you know, indicating this moon covering the sun, solar eclipse notion. Um, there's a Camilleroy oral tradition that describes the appearances, the appearance of a total solar eclipse. Um, and we see that story that we told on that previous page about um, the moon covering the woman in an embrace. So while these may appear to be simple stories, they're really descriptors to understand the characteristics of the sun and moon, to make sense of these solar eclipses. They describe the sun chasing the moon, which relates to the very precise differences in speed across our sky between these two celestial objects. It describes the moon zigzagging away from the sun, which is describing the plane variation of the moon's path in our sky. This is very complex knowledge, um, you know, only available through consistent observation and, and an attempt to understand what is happening above. So our sun's path has a slight variation across the year, and the path it takes across our sky, what we refer to as the ecliptic path, um, so this is where it's, they understood the difference between the sun's path and the moon's path as being variable, as being different variations. So since all the planets and us with our moons orbit the sun, we are roughly in the same plane of orbit with degrees of variation, right? So if you track the planets and moon across our sky, they'll generally track along the same trail line. But this varies over time and these variations are different for the moon and the sun. This highlights significant attention to detail in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander observers. And the moon covering the sun, that is a complex understanding of a total eclipse. And like I said, these only occur every 400 years. So this really speaks to the longevity of this story and the capacity for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to keep a story, retell a story generation to generation, even if it's not been seen in 300 years, not been seen in 390 years, to keep retelling that story so that once it does become relevant, once the next community does see a total solar eclipse, they'll have a word for it, they'll have a story for it, it will make sense. Okay, let's look at the moon and tides. So I've got a quote here that I want to read on moon and tides, and it's by Alice C. Williams in 2016. It says, Tides are the rise and fall of sea levels caused by the gravitational forces of the sun and moon and Earth's rotation on its axis. And this is the scientific definition that relates the moon to the tides. And yet every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community knew these. Sorry, it's an email I'm getting on a weekend. It dings like that nonstop. Um, so we knew the effects that the moon had on the tides. So if we look to, say, Arnhem Land, we can see stories there explaining the relationship between moon phases and tidal changes. Um, perhaps the most intricate story is one that they have which explains why spring tides are linked to the new moon and full moon phases. So in the Arnhem story, it states that the moon fills with water as it rises, which is why the tides are so high. The tide falls when the water runs from the moon, which leave the moon empty for three days. After the three days, the moon refills with water. So we're talking here about that relationship. There's that understanding that the moon and water are related, that they are interconnected. If we look to the Yolnu mob, they associate the moon phases with water as it rises. So at high tide, the moon is full. The ebbing of tides come as the moon drains his water. When he is full, the Yolnu view him as fat and lazy, not wanting to share his food. And so he's punished by his wives. They chop at his body with axes, which is why we see the moon waning away 
right? He's being, he's being hacked at by his wives for, for hoarding all of the food. It takes him three days to die, and before he comes back as a waxy moon, he continues to eat and grow fat until his wives have to kill him again. So these stories show a really sophisticated understanding of the effects that moon phase changes have on tidal changes, but also they speak to cultural law and cultural customs and that community comes first, right? And when we look at the sharing of resources, like that is such a huge core tenant of Aboriginal culture that everything is shared. Um, and if we see a, a person in these narratives hoarding all of the food, um, then punishment is, is acceptable for that because it is such a non-Aboriginal and non-Torres Strait Islander thing to engage in. We look further west at the Bardi mob of Western Australia. They used their understandings of moon phases to predict tidal changes so that they could travel between islands at low tides. Um, this was really important knowledge. Um, it was used to you know, safely collect um, marine animals for consumption. We actually see this practice really commonly, this, this looking to the moon to understand tidal changes um, for, for moving between islands. Many coastal and inland mobs use this moon knowledge to inform things such as cultural um, activities, hunting and agricultural practices, um, when you can collect certain marine foods. Um, if we look at the Torres Strait Islander peoples, they use the moon knowledge um, for crayfish harvesting and other fishing activities. Uh, fishing in the Torres Strait, uh, there's knowledges there that describe how it's better at a neap tide uh, that's because the water is clearer. It's the meant to be the best for fishing um, if you conduct it during the first and third quarters of the moon phases. During a spring tide, the waters are cloudy. They're full of sediment from the tidal movement. You can't see the fish as easily, so fishing is reduced. Um, so we're using these sky changes, these, these changes in the moon, to govern you know, things on the earth. And again, we keep coming back to that interconnected nature of the sky and the earth and community. Now, what's more interesting is that for many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups across Australia, the word for moon and the word for month are either the same word or they're very, very similar. And what this says is, what this says about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities is that we, we can show that connection, uh, that knowledge associated with the passing of time as being connected to moon cycles. You know, if we look at uh, Torres Strait Islander peoples, the word Meb in Miriam Mur, which is the language of Torres Strait, of the Eastern Torres Strait peoples, it means both moon and month, and it explains the complete cycle over the course of the month. Um, that was Hamacher, that quote. <clears throat> so we're seeing this connection, not just in one or two communities, but across Australia, across Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, this distinct knowledge of the effects of the tide um, and the effects of the moon, the phases of the moon on tidal changes. Okay, let's look at star position relationships. 